thank you, Les, for you coming the long way to Berlin to give an introduction to EFT and skills training uh, for EFT for couples at our center. We arranged this workshop in cooperation with the DGVT. It seems to me that EFT is a prominent bridge that connects psychotherapeutic schools or camps. Um, Les, you are the father of EFT. What has moved you into the work with emotions and uh, move you doing research on psychotherapy of emotion. Um, yeah. Well, um, you know, as you know, I was an engineer, right? And I have a master's degree in engineering, and I was sort of doing a little bit of mathematical decisional uh, processes there, but I think I came to it both because I tell the story that I solved a math problem in my final exam and I had at university and I had no idea how I solved the problem and so I believed always in that I can know that I know more than I can see. Yeah. So I was interested in Polonia and personal knowledge and the fact that there was another source of information and that slowly led me into emotion. I think also personally, I knew that my emo I was being schooled as a rational engineer. I valued rationality a lot, but I always understood that my emotions were what really guided me in living. Mm -hmm. So I think that combination led me to both change to psychology and then I began to look at the process of change and I think I was taken with both empathy for emotion, I mean understanding people's feelings, and that somehow when people became more emotionally engaged, they were going deeper into their issues. So some of it was actually seeing that, but I was already biased towards seeing that, you know. And mm -hmm being a constructivist anyhow, I mean, you, you know, I saw what I believed in, I'm sure. But, um, so that started a process more and more, and I came into psychology in 1968, 1970, and there was hardly anything done on emotion, and that was shocking to me. Yeah. Um, so I just started uh, searching out everything that I could in emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a woman called Magda Arnold who'd written a little book on emotion and when I became a professor at UBC I invited her there to come and give a talk. But I, that was already after in my dissertation I had uh, studied emotion and become just interested in emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think it's, it's that sort of how it emerged. But I think it was also that there was so little written about emotion when it seemed to me to be the most central yeah. issue of life. Why uh, there is not much written on emotion? Well, now there is, you yeah. know, since the 80s. Yeah. Well, I, th I think it's two things, that rational people were afraid of emotions. I mean, I do think it's as simple as that. And the predominant view is that emotions are disorganizing and bad. But also, I think it's because emotion was so complex. Yeah. And it was so many different things, and people couldn't get a handle on describing it. They couldn't measure it. Yeah. And so, you know, why it wasn't scientifically studied was a lot because you couldn't get a measure of it or it was hard to get a measure of it and to define what it really was. As a supervisor and facilitator in systemic therapy, I was fascinated by EFT as I began to read about EFT some years primarily after I met you and 
joined the training in Dortmund um, since two years. I think EFT is one important or even the most important missing link because the modern systemic therapy become more and more language, cognition and behavioral oriented. Um, systemic therapists are in fact still practicing some experience oriented methods as Virginia Satya taught us, but using the miracle question and deconstructing narratives became more and more popular. Um, my question is, well, I know you had a training, uh, a systemic training at the MRI. Um, my question is, are there some systemic elements becoming part of the EFT? If yes, which are those? Yeah, I mean, very strongly. So, well, EFT for couples. I yeah. mean, in individual, it's not as systemic uh, because we do focus more intrapsychically, but I mean, EFT for couples is really an integration of intrapsychic and interactional or systemic and so I went well firstly I had trained with Virginia Satir as well yeah. I mean in a I'd been to a five-day retreat workshop with her my wife and I had been and so I was sort of uh, and you know I'd read her and everything uh, so I knew a lot about her but then I went to MRI and I studied in an externship with Watzlawick and Slusky and, and I was very impressed with this notion of tracking interaction and I was tracking emotion mm -hmm. moment by moment and they were very good at tracking interaction moment by moment and communication moment by moment. But I mean I remember coming away from that feeling but they just didn't include emotion. And I once spoke to Mnuchin and said to him, you know, you're really good at working with emotion. And uh, I, I was impressed with Mnuchin very much. And he, his reply to me was, I work with emotion, cognition or behavior, anything that changes boundaries. But you know, my sense was that it was that he was working with emotion to change boundaries that gave a lot of um, effectiveness to what he was doing. So essentially, I came back from MRI and began to develop the emotionally focused couples therapy. Uh, and then my student, Sue Johnson, was a part of that development. And um, I essentially saw myself as adding emotion to the notion of cycles and interactions, and that was the integration. I had also studied the resolution of intrapsychic conflict in self-critical processes. And that looked like, in two chairs, a two-chair dialogue. So that looked like a couple actually, because one part blamed and the other part defended. And I develop, had developed a model of resolution of that, which involved emotion in, in the uh, one party, particularly in the one who was defending. So, it was sort of like, let's, I started, I got a big grant to study a couple's conflict to see if it was similar to individual conflict. And, you know, there was some similarity, like the notion of the softening of the blame, and that actually came from the individual uh, conflict. So I would see that it's a, uh, significant integration of systemic and emotionally focused um, perspectives, yeah. right, the yeah. couple's therapy. And uh, I think my learning about systemic therapy, and I was quite in, in, involved in it for five or ten years, um, you know, definitely helped create the couple's therapy mm -hmm. as an integration of these two perspectives. Yeah. 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 
Let our institute bear the notion of mindfulness in its name. And we think mindfulness is an important competency of a therapist. Generally, we think mindfulness is a key aspect for emotion regulation. Marsha Linhan DBT is using mindfulness elements in its practice. Does mindfulness play any role in EFT? Well, you know, it's a complicated thing because I learned uh, Gestalt awareness yeah. back in the 60s and 70s. Now that came from Zen Buddhism and it came from a kind of Zen meditation, really. And that was, now I'm aware of what's going on inside of me, what's in the world, and so on. I mean, mindfulness and meditation now, as I understand it, you know, is similar, but also has some differences. Yeah. You know? And it depends now what we mean by mindfulness. But I recently, with a colleague of mine who is a mindfulness meditator, you know, wrote a book called Therapeutic Presence. So I think this being in the present and uh, being aware is very important. I mean, mindfulness meditation in which you sort of let things come and go inside is a little different because we talk about focusing on your emotion and going into it. Whereas in mindfulness, it's more of a regulation device used for clients. So yeah. there's therapist presence as one thing, and then there's using mindfulness as a, a regulating device, you know, as a treatment. Yeah. And uh, I do think that the elements of breath regulation, of taking a working distance and observing your own experience yeah. is helpful in not being overwhelmed by emotion. Yes. But I think there's more that's needed. Yeah, so you go into the emotion. Yeah, yeah. And not going a distance to the emotion as the mindfulness right. are talking about. Right, although we incorporate both. That, and then it becomes, which is a hallmark of yeah. emotion focused, is when do you do what? Yes. Sometimes you'll need more regulation, sometimes you need more activation, yes. sometimes transformation. Yeah. Um, so I recently went to the Tibetan Buddhist, Thich Hach Nhan, yeah. and he's most similar in that he talks more about going in. But I still felt that, you know, the there isn't in mindfulness here uh, uh, an articulation of how to change an emotion. Yeah. It's just like let it pass through you. Yeah. And I think in EFT we really focused on how do you change, take people to their painful place, but then how it's transformed yeah. by accessing more adaptive emotions and so on. Yeah, but there so is an overlap. Yeah. <laughs> a first step is you have to arrive at a place before you can leave it. Yeah. So it is at first arrive at it, accept it, let it be, so to speak, but not then and it'll just go away. But then how do you actually, once you've arrived at it, how do you leave it? Last, my experience as couples therapist is that Intimate relationship is a place where people could severely hurt each other, where love turns into pain. You have done research on emotional injury and forgiveness. How could we accompany clients or couples to forgive each other in therapy? Do you have experience with couples forgiving each other? I have the feeling it is an emotionally longer journey to be able to forgive. You know, I was surprised. We did a, a project, 12 sessions, yeah. and the injury had to be at least two years old so that people weren't in the traumatic state. Injuries were often betrayals like yeah. affairs, right? 
we were very surprised that people really got over <laughs> some of the injuries. Now, they were ready, so there's yeah. couple readiness, yeah. you know. Like I had a colleague who uh, actually came from um, Armenia and she was quite involved, like there had been Armenian massacres and so on, you know. And she was talking to me and she's saying, you know, people won't forgive in 12 sessions. Yeah. And yet they did. And we followed them, you know, for some time afterwards. So it is possible. Yeah. Um, but I think you have to go into it emotionally deeply. And three sort of elements stand out for me. The one is I think you really have to help people work with the idiosyncratic meaning of the injury. There's always a very individual meaning. Yeah. So it's not just you betrayed me, but it's you betrayed me having an affair while we were trying to get pregnant or it was with my best friend or you know, so you, you've got to get to what the really core hurt or injury is. And then we found that the key to forgiveness was that the injurer expressed shame yeah. rather than guilt and really showed the face of shame to the partner. Yeah. Because shame touches the own values. Right, exactly. You know, shame is not guilt. Yeah. Because the traditional thing is the person says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But after, you know, a while they say, I've said I'm sorry a hundred times, but when yeah. are you ever going to forgive me? So sorry doesn't do it, right? It doesn't. Yeah. Because that isn't trustworthy. But when the person expresses shame, they're saying, you know, in terms of their own values, I've let myself down, I am ashamed of myself. And that seems to make an impact. And I think also on the darker side of human nature that there's a kind of balancing of the ledger or it's a feeling of justice is done. If you suffer yeah. shame, you're suffering for your betrayal or for hurting me and then I hurt, you hurt. It's kind of like fair, fairness and justice. I think the other part is not pushing the untrusting partner to trust. Yes. So you really have to uh, validate the wall of mistrust and not have the injurer try to get the other person to trust. And that helps paradoxically to trust if you, if you don't try to yeah. get them to trust too quickly. So I have felt that people can forgive and rebond. Um, but it's also a process and it's often, I forgive you today, but tomorrow yeah. Um, it may, I may yeah. feel less forgiving, but a progression towards. So I think if people really deal with it and deal with the pain, that they do actually forgive and move on. But some people let go and move on without necessarily forgiving. But this is the issue of reconciliation. Yes. Um, uh, but I think forgiveness is helpful and important for reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think sometimes couples accept and put it to the side, but don't actually forgive. And they can still reconcile mm -hmm. and get on. But somehow it needs time. <laughs> well, it does need time, yeah. but um, before I did this study, I would have thought it needs much more time. Um, so you're surprised that yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, if they go into treatment, but of course, maybe just 
these people were all ready to go into treatment. Uh, yeah, but it is a time-based process, like grief. I mean, it's a time-based process because the injury lessens its impact in time for the injured one, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Les, for this interview. Well, I'm looking forward to join the training these coming days. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right.